Welcome. I am Anna, and on behalf of the program group, I'm very excited to present this year's keynote talks at Knutpunkt. Uh, our speakers come from different countries, come from different LARP scenes, and have very different perspectives on our LARP community. We uh, have assigned them with the, the different suits of the deck of cards. So that's their only way of knowing what they should do. And they had it turned out great, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we hope that these very small, intensive talks of 10 minutes will inspire you, will inspire thoughts and conversations on Knutpunkt. We will not have time to take questions um, because it's so uh, speedy and intensive. But I have talked to the, the different speakers and they would love to talk about their thoughts afterwards because this is their heart blood and they uh, would love to share it with you. Mm? Uh, so first up, we have Karina Ingo and Mohamed Rabah, who will speak from the suit of hearts and the personal experience. According to them, Palestines and Danes are experts in conflicts and solving them. They are here tonight to talk about their secret. Sometimes a bird is a bird, and sometimes it needs to die. <laughs> Welcome, Karina and Mohamed. Is it on? Yes. <laughs> Mine is not. It is? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of, lot of people. Yeah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Let's start. Let's start. Yeah. I want to start by telling a story. We love stories. Three Danes and three Palestinians walking in the woods of Denmark. In the backyard, you hear this picking voice getting louder and louder. And all the Danes are getting immensely excited about this message, uh, messenger of spring, talking about the bird a woodpecker. The interesting part is that I'm going to share with you that the Danes get so excited, they run to the tree and the point and the bird going like, come on friends, look at this bird, it's amazing. It's our spring messenger. Palestinians are looking around the trees, don't see the bird, or maybe they see the bird, they look for another bird. The Danes get even more excited. They bring the Palestinians to the tree, they almost climb up there to point out the bird. It turns out that we only have that one bird, so we go like, this is a woodpecker. We have to save the bird. We save the trees in Denmark just for that bird. It's a very cute and amazingly nice bird. When we figure out that the bird, Palestinians point like, no, that needs to die. All the Danes go like, no, 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 you don't see the bird. That bird is cute. We need to save it. Again, the Palestinians go like, no, 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 you don't get it. That bird needs to die. One smart Dane, one very smart Palestinian, go in the back of the group. They start with Google Translate. They found out that they're both talking about a woodpecker. Then they went on Google to look at the picture just to make sure it is a woodpecker. It is. Then the Danes go like, we don't get it. This bird is amazing. You can't kill that bird. Then the Palestinians go like, you have no idea how much we want to kill that bird. <laughs> because when in Palestine, that bird is picking holes in our water tanks. And that bird is the only reason that we have to have metal water tank containing our drinking water. 
Oh, the Danish say. <laughs> it must be something kind of like the doves in Copenhagen. <laughs> that did not turn into a conflict. It could have. Mohammed will explain more about that. Yeah. So, I come from a country, Palestine, occupied, a lot of conflicts going on there, underdeveloped, and a lot of international people come to help us with their really good intentions. The thing is, helping us is not what we need. We need fr to learn from each other, and I will explain that now. We are not only different by race or religion or our sexual orientation. We are different because we are also products of different systems. There is a very common stereotype about Palestinian or Arab that we are always late. We don't respect time. <laughs> and somehow true. <laughs> <laughs> but there's reasons behind that. I try to like to study why. So I was traveling to Europe. I really enjoy trains. I love them. And after a long of time of analyzing and studying, I discovered the reason is trains. You have like more than 150 years of trains. The train driver doesn't stop to buy bread. <laughs> <laughs> the train doesn't wait till all the passengers are in. <laughs> And that's what happened in our case, in our public transportation. So before you tell me my stereotypes about me, you just have to analyze where it comes from, where my behavior is coming from. It's coming from the system that I was living in. I will, we work with young people. We bring people from Denmark. We work with young people from Palestine. There are people from two different groups. They have some stereotypes and prejudices about each other at the beginning. So little knowledge about each other, a lot of anxiety, less safety. And in order for us to make them work together, we have to work on this theory. It's Albert Berg theory, written in the 60s, about contact hypothesis, how to make contact between groups to reduce intergroup bias. We need equal status for both groups. We need to task, coordinate the task between each group when they are working together. And we, we need to put goals for these groups. We, just, we, we don't let them like that, just work together. We need to define really goals achievable. We need support from the authorities, and here is the support from Bifrost and Betty Butte, or in some cases it can be support from uh, the religious guy or the person or uh, the family and acquaintance potential. The more people from Palestine and Denmark work together, the more it becomes easier. Because I know Karina, Karina know Anders, then it's become easier and easier in the future. We need also to work on moderator, moderators. Each group has to also flourish her its identity and practice it without shame. If we work on that, the, the knowledge will increase uh, about, uh, between the two groups. The perspectives will be taken. The anxiety will be reduced, and the empathy will increase. And then there will be more results in the future. We also have to consider that each group will go through different stages. Forming, when we start, everyone is looking for their position in the group, how they defined their position in the group, and then storming, clashes happens. It's a must, we can't avoid it. And then norming, it's when the group start to accept each other, define goal and vision, and then the performing when the results are start to come out. And finally, adjuring, we can't work together forever. <laughs> <laughs> The thing is that we have to accept that we are different and we have to question ourselves. And the most important thing from this cooperation is to 
discover and learn about ourselves and what privilege we had for granted. This is what we learned when we have to point it out to you guys. We have different meanings and different perspectives. The birds is a very good example of that. The woodpecker is a woodpecker in Copenhagen. It's also a woodpecker in Ramallah. But we don't love the bird both places. And I promise you, when I'm back in Ramallah, I'm not going to love it either. Our secret, Mohammed and me, is that we don't try to avoid the conflicts. We want them. But we want them to be constructive. We want to have a strategy how to work with them. The reason why the bird didn't turn into a conflict, one, we could Google it, two, we could see it, three, we believe in the best intentions of each other. We do really, in definitions, and they are different, love each other, and we know. So we work with critical thinking. And what we want to share with you today is there's 27 different nationalities here. Within those nationalities, you have differences too. That's your gift of the tough learning of being here. So instead of going out and trying to convince people you know better, please look for your woodpickers and get inspired and get a bigger world out of being here the next four days. That's what we want to give you to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krina and Mohammed. So the woodpickers, we have to take them with us too. Next up. Uh, we have Jeff Moxley who will be talking from the suit of clubs and practical design. He is currently working as the managing director of both Dystopia Rising Lab Network in America and the Danish-based Dystopia Lab Studios. His main focus is making a better experience for the people that run events so that they can do the same for the participants. Today, he will talk about professional lobbying and how to make it a growing field. Please welcome Jeff. To hit. There we go. Hi, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> Thank you so much. So my previous guys were hearts. They were talking from their heart. I am here to talk about practical things, which means that I wrote it down. <laughs> Give me a second here. All right. It's my job today to speak to you guys about the practical part of running a LARP. Uh, oh, I need slide one. Here we go. Nope, that's them. The other way. Yep. Think practically. <laughs> Very important shit. Uh, the side of the LARP that's usually taken for granted, like knowing how much toilet paper to buy, how many beds I'll need based on how many single couples or singles or couples I have going to the event, um, uh, or for, Europe for Europeans based uh, figuring out how much alcohol and condoms you need to buy. It's very different. Very different where I come from. The best advice that I can give to all of you uh, is to think three steps ahead and take the advice of my favorite philosopher, Douglas Adams, and don't panic. Today, however, I want to talk to you on a deeper level about uh, what we need to do beyond the office work and into the conceptual. So when I started working in LARP, I was a project manager running little small events, and now I'm a managing director. It's very fancy. <clears throat> I work with spreadsheets, I say things like allocate resources, and despite the fact that I work in LARP, I haven't attended one in almost a year. I'm too busy working on them. By all accounts, I should be wearing tan pants and actually know how to tie a tie. My job is very corporate, and likely viewed as boring by most people here in any way uh, that you wouldn't think somebody who works in LARPs for a living uh, has, a, has an actual job. Sometimes there's a round of applause at the end of an event, for those of us who did all the boring office work, struggling with the printers, staring at computers, and sitting alone in that room where nobody ever smiles. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's sad. Uh, in order for all of you guys to wear silly hats, try out new accents, and have fun. And while the appreciation is there from all of you guys, and we could feel it, 
The success of a game is usually viewed by the creativity put into it. All the wonderful creati uh, creative design that goes into it, the inspired game worlds, and the artistic creation of props and practical design, which we'll hear about next, uh, uh, and, not, uh, and not for the paper pushes that allowed uh, all the talented people in order to make them shine. But now I want to talk to you guys uh, about what it's like. <laughs> now I want to talk to my fellow paper pushers in the audience. I want to talk to you, create, uh, and all of you creatives can take uh, take a chance. Take 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 five minutes and and think about whatever the fuck it is you creatives think about. <laughs> Wizards or some shit like that. <laughs> so all my all my all my paper pushers out there, if what you're doing is boring, mundane, or typical, then you're doing your jobs wrong. Innovation and creativity should be our main focus, even in an office environment. We need to redefine what it is that we do in our minds. We are all involved in a hobby that is decades old and which has never found mainstream success. Uh, even in a marketplace today that's saturated with nerd culture. And that's our fault. Uh, we paper pushers need to take a note from our more creative halves and start thinking and st stop thinking in standard paths. Uh, if we look at our building billion dollar uh, company competitors like Google and Netflix, Facebook and Airbnb, the things that they have in common are a CEO that doesn't play by the playbook and use standard rules. Uh, and rather they come at their jobs as uh, problems that need creative solutions. Page two. <laughs> this is our real task. Finding ways to innovate in business is something that we need to focus on to turn our LARPs into something bigger and wider reaching. We need to use our creative brains to find ways to, use, uh, to market ourselves and ways to increase product connectivity to our customers and explore new ways to structure our companies so that we can put, our, uh, we can put out the best and widest reach possible to everybody else out in the world. Bless you. Now I know what you're thinking right now. Look at this typical American over here talking about corporatization and monetization of my pure and educational hobby. <laughs> and what I have to say about that is you're absolutely right. That is what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not going to deny it. The way that I look at LARP is as a business. And that might sound like a really bad thing to a lot of you guys. But what I can tell you is that this mindset has brought LARP to thousands of people all across the world who would have otherwise never known what it is that all of us do. We've built communities, we've forged lifelong friendships, marriages, children, and we brought LARPing to nations in desperate need of love and emotional release. We've allowed people uh, whose lives, uh, uh, who feel trapped in their lives to get an escape and learn how special they are. And this is the power of what we do, the power of what everyone in here does. That's LARP. I believe in it. So this is me, again, speaking to all of you wonderful coordinators, organizers, and office workers, to don't, uh, uh, <laughs> don't think that you're just there to prop up your creatives in your life. You are creative too, and you are imaginative too. And use those wonderful talents to turn your games into something that reaches into the hearts and minds of people that you will never, ever meet. Let these beautiful stories and cathartic emotional releases touch the world and make humanity better for it. If they don't know we exist, then they'll never know about the beauty of what it is that we do. So if you still think that I'm an evil American trying to kill your soul, that's fine. <laughs> Let me explain this in another way. We spend so much of our time talking about inclusive gameplay that allows anyone, no matter their race, religion, identity, uh, uh, or sexual orientation, to be able to participate in our games. But this should include strangers who don't know what LARP is finding ways to get everyday people to love what it is that we do. I'm, uh, it means being successful and not keeping our games in dark corners where only us and our close groups of friends can play amongst ourselves. If you were at an event and saw someone in a corner not engaging in the game, a good role player would go over, introduce yourself, and make them feel included. And we need to take that same attitude to the world. We event runners need to find people who are, not uh, who are not engaged and make them feel included in what we do. We need to make strangers feel welcome. If you guys think that role play is powerful and a cathartic tool to help people, then why not shout it from the rooftops? If you had a medicine that healed the sick, it would be immoral to not find a way to give it to as many people as possible. And if you believe, uh, if you believe in it, then you should share it with the world. And, uh, and that means finding meaning uh, finding ways to bring it to new markets. 
Success is not a dirty word in LARP. It means that game runners with creative, thank you, <laughs> it means that game runners, some game runner was creative and innovative enough to relate their product to the outside uh, world, outside of their local friend sphere. It means that one of you office worker types was able to find a way to make what we do accessible to the world. And I know that in five and 10 years, I wanna come to a conference like this that's 10 to 100 times its size meeting from pe people from all over the world who bring their unique perspectives to improve what LARP is. This is our job. Us white collar warriors, <laughs> us clerical clerics, <laughs> and us boring barbarians, we are the ones that LARP needs to help thrive and grow. So let's get our dry erase markers, our management software, and do what we do best, innovate for the betterment of our businesses for our hobby, and the people whose hearts and minds we can one day touch. Thank you. That's for you. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. So now we have talked to all the people in the office also. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Next up, we have uh, Krede, and uh, Krede will talk from diamonds, and that's active experiences. Uh, Krede is curious about how her experience and background as a clinical psychologist can be used to make sense of what happens to us when we love and role play. Through her talk, she will explore some of the things that we know about the, the psychology of play, what might occur when we actively manipulate our behavior <laughs> and explore how to increase flexibility in the ways we relate to the world, both inside and outside ourselves. Welcome, Kreide. Okay, is it on? Yes. yes. Hello, <coughs> my name is Karete jakobsen Melan and uh, I am uh, a clinical psychologist working in Oslo, Norway. And uh, now I will try to provide you with a very short glimpse into one psychologist's take on, uh, on LARP. Of possible beneficial things, for instance, that might happen to us when we LARP. It's uh, hopefully a talk of, of pep and of excitement, because it is exciting. Uh, but first, I would like to talk a little bit about play. Because uh, I hope that we can all agree that LARPing in some sense or another involves play or playfulness of, of creative and, and spontaneous interactions. And all animals, including humans, we engage in this behavior called play. But why? Why do we play? Or maybe how do we know how to play? And researchers have been discussing this for plenty of years. Is play something that we just inherently know how to do? Something that is deeply embedded in like the most basic reptilian structures that we have in our brain? Or is play something we'll learn to do as we grow up? So when, when the field of psychology realizes that the research they want to do on humans is unethical. <laughs> they do research on rats <laughs> instead. So if we have uh, one group of rats that have their brains all intact, as they are supposed to be, and then we have one group of rats where we surgically remove some parts of their brain so that they are only left with their most basic reptilian brain structures. And then we sort of, we put them all together and we see what happens. They still play. The two groups of rats with different sort of brains left, <laughs> they show no differences in terms of playfulness. So presumably, just like other things that we do in order to survive, like sleeping and breathing and eating and experiencing basic emotions, play is sort of innate in our brains. It's something that we inherently know. And from an evolutionary perspective, we have the stuff that we have in our brains and our bodies because it has been proven to be good for us. 
So we could assume that in one way or another, play is essential for our survival. It's at least not destroying our chances of survival completely, because if it did, playful rats and humans would have died off thousands of years ago, because they are probably super easy prey, being very loud and tumbling around and doing lots of <laughs> weird stuff. But playful rats did not die off. In fact, the rats that are the most skilled at playing are also the ones that are most attractive when it comes to mating. <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, the researchers, they still disagree why. So we don't know why. Why does play seem to be <laughs> something that is at the very core of our existence? And this is where I'm going to sort of jump back to the to the starting point, talking about possible benefits of LARPing. So if you guys are only going to remember one word or one concept of, from my talk, I hope that it will be this, flexibility. And when I, as a psychologist, when I talk about flexibility, I, I think of being adaptable, of being open to experiences, of being curious about yourself and the world around you. And I think of resilience. A flexible brain is a very robust brain. It is a brain that is able to understand and make sense of and adapt to different situations, input and demands. And I sort of think that when we LARP, we LARP our brains a bit more flexible. Play and, uh, and LARPing, it's, of course it's fun, and it's satisfying just in itself, and that's not irrelevant at all. But in addition, for instance, when we LARP, we also explore a social world. How do we navigate social interactions? How do we give and take? And that sounds super simple, but it's very complicated processes going on in the brain. We practice conflict resolution and, and how to deal with disagreements. We discover where our limits are in relation to other people. And we also get to explore different emotions and thoughts and body language and limits and actions of other people, not only like the players, but also the characters. And in certain LARPs, we are also allowed to experiment with different ways to navigate these social environments. I mean, I usually talk. <laughs> That's how I navigate my social interactions. So for me, it's really exciting if I try to navigate one non-verbally or crawling on the floor <laughs> or maybe with some senses altered, like blindfolded, and then maybe some of my other senses will be heightened, potentially. So I think we could pretty easily guess that if we are allowed to safely explore different social worlds, it enables us to to both practice and also broaden our social skills. And slightly related to this, we also do know that if you're being exposed to fiction, in books or movies or plays and so on, it actually positively predicts measures of social ability as well. Another point when talking about social benefits of LARPing is of course that if you have the chance to meet more new people, it also increases your chances that you will get to know them and that you will also get more friends. And many of us who are here now, we are traveling around our countries and, and around the world to LARP and to go to conferences and festivals like Knutpunkt. So being part of, I don't know, several LARP communities sort of shows us this broad spectrum of countries and cultures and impulses and attitudes. I think it's a bit difficult to see the writing, but it's there. <laughs> the names of the LARPs and so on. When we LARP, we, uh, we embody our characters and we create stories together. And because of the fact that we LARP with our own bodies, the emotions we experience when we LARP, like betrayal, happiness and interest, fear, sadness, curiosity, lust and anger, to your body and to your brain, they are all real. And, and LARPers, we, sometimes we talk about the separation between the, the character and the player. And that separation is an important one in the sense that 
sort of we need to have an alibi to behave differently as a character than we would as a player. And your conscious, rational, intelligent brain knows that you're LARPing, it knows that you're role playing. But your reptilian brain, your basic brain structures, they don't. For them, everything you do is real and true. So your reptile brain just continues doing whatever it does best. It's, it's helping you survive. And it doesn't care if you're at work or, or playing a LARP or on your bus on your way to the LARP. It does what it does. And here is a very important lesson about your reptile brain. <laughs> you cannot talk sense to it. You cannot think sense to it. It doesn't help and it doesn't listen when you say, but I know that all of this is fictional. <laughs> or you say, stop being scared of that person. It's, it's your friend dressed in a weird uh, costume acting scary. <laughs> your reptile brain will still go like, oh, it's super scary. <laughs> <laughs> and then for me, I am very, I'm scared of heights. <laughs> So uh, if I stand here, uh, I know rationally this is not dangerous. I will keep telling myself that this is not dangerous. I will not hurt myself very badly if I fall down. But my reptile brain is still going like, "Why? <laughs> it's so high, you will, you will hurt yourself. And it says, go back, go back, go back, go back. So that's what it does. Your reptile brain doesn't listen to your words. It listens to your actions. It listens to how you behave in different situations. So if I go over here and it says, whoa, scary, and I go back, the reptile brain will say, ha, I was right. <laughs> it was dangerous because you had to go back. <laughs> but if I go over here and I'm like, ah, this is not dangerous. I can stand there forever. They will catch me. I'm all good. <laughs> My reptile brain will go, oh, oh OK, OK. <laughs> Okay, so it wasn't really dangerous. This is, uh, this is how we're doing it. When we act differently than we usually do, it gives our brain a chance to sort of reshuffle and rewire the structures that's going or that are up there. And it makes sense too. We know that learning through experience, through trying stuff out, is a lot more powerful than just reading about it or hearing other people talking about it. We also know that emotional narratives engage readers more than neutral content. So if we read something that is emotional to us, our brains lit up a lot more. There's a lot more energy going on. And we also remember it a lot better if it was emotional. In addition, emotions makes, they make us more empathic towards the protagonists of the stories that we're reading. And when we are LARPing, we sort of are the protagonists of our own stories. And uh, some research has actually also shown that, that role players score significantly higher on empathic involvement than non-role players. So, in addition, having a strong tendency to become absorbed, to become immersed in something, also predict higher empathy scores. So through LARP, I think we have a really huge opportunity for empathic growth, if we take it. This quote, I will read it in case you don't see it, it's from 1856 and it says the greatest benefit we owe the artist, whether painter, poet or novelist, is the extension of our empathies. And I'm going to tweak it a little bit and say the greatest benefit we owe the artist, whether painter, poet, novelist or LARPer, is the extension of our empathies. But uh, of course, I don't think any and all LARPs in themselves just are inherently brain flexibility enhancers. It all depends on the LARP, it depends on the context, it depends on the execution and who you are as yourself, as a LARPer, what do you bring to the table? But I, I sort of also think that you get my point. And I think it's really cool. The best thing about this is that it shows us that we can actually change brain connectivity. <laughs> and functions at the core of the brain, we can change the way that we immediately uh, respond to our thoughts and emotions and to other people simply through changing our own behavior. 
simply maybe through LARPing. And roughly speaking, this is also what I do every day at work when I work with exposure therapy for anxiety. It's increasing flexibility. So in this talk, I have included several very clear simplifications about the world. And there are like tons of stuff that we still don't know. And there are so many elements of LARP that makes this all a lot more difficult and, and uncertain, but it's so interesting. <laughs> so <coughs> if you want to talk more about it or have any ideas, please come to me or send me an email. You can do that as well. But that was all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greta. So flexibility, remember that. <laughs> Next speaker is Hilda Levine, uh, who will speak from the suit of spades and design and lab theory. She's a dramaturg, a theatre uh, pedagogue and a lawyer. During her dramaturgy studies, she has turned most of her academic work into lab research. Miming the mining the possibilities of the similarities and differences between theatre and LARP. In her keynote, she would like to bring the post-dramatic theatre and contemporary LARP together to show you how the two art forms are related and may be of value of each other. Welcome, Hilda. Thank you. Yes, I will talk about uh, Nordic LARP and post-dramatic theater. So, yes. Let's start with what is post-dramatic theater? Um, an obvious question. Uh, it's a movement starting in the 60s, uh, trying to break free from the dominance of the realism uh, on the theater stage at the time, and also to break free from the pre-written text that was the main a main medium for communication also at the theatre stage. Hence the word post-dramatic. And these movements try to find new ways uh, to create more active involvement uh, um, in the theatre event, and thereby ending up exploring many of the same areas that we as LARPers are exploring today. This is why I think it's interesting for you to hear about these movements, um, and I will show you just how they might correspond. Now, first of all, the, to create more active involvement, um, these theater uh, experiments have often involved participation, trying to challenge the divide between the audience and the stage, uh, to create more active citizens, or create uh, more transformative experiences. Today, we have the immersive theater, where uh, you can see the audience partaking in uh, the universe of the play here as ghosts in Macbeth. Another way to create more active involvements is to um, move away from the text to look at other means of communication for a more total experience. One of these is to turn to more visual aesthetics, such as these, um, and they often create very symbolic and dreamlike universes. And this design has also somehow found its way into LARP, as we can see when we compare this set design to that of Delirium. Um, and these uh, highly visual aesthetics may also be participatory, as once again in Punch Trunk, where part of the, uh, what's alluring with the experience is to move around in these amazing 3D sets. Other senses may also be of interest to these, uh, to these um, theater workers, also exploring, for example, touch here in a performance at the Black Box Theatre in Oslo, where we got to touch a great deal of many things, also while in darkness. And of course, most LARPs are both participatory and physical and sensory experiences. But some explore the sensory means more than others. For example, what we playfully will call Nina form. <laughs> and this breaking away um, from the text um, can be seen, and, and the realism, can in many ways be seen as an answer to film becoming better at realism than theatre was. Trying to find new ways to stay relevant. But it's also in many ways a postmodern movement, 
trying to break away from the one accepted narrative, be it on the stage or in society. And as such, they started deconstructing uh, plays uh, and putting them together in new ways. This is an old example uh, of a deconstruction of Hamlet. And nowadays you can see the place by Anna Pettersson, where she is cutting up Ibsen and Strindberg plays to open up for new interpretations. This is also uh, um, a means to go look for uh, multiple interpretations in a work as well, as one has grown tired of uh, works that will only get trying to prove a point, but wants uh, everyone to be able to make up their mind. Now, of course, most LARPs have multiple narratives, they, ha they can have multiple interpretations, but some LARPs have most more post-dramatic qualities than others, such as, for example, A Nice Evening with the Family, cutting up famous plays and putting them back together in new ways. This deconstructing turn may also be turned towards the theatre event itself, trying to play with the difference between fiction and reality on stage. Now, breaking the fourth wall and letting the character talk to the audience is very old. But in the post-dramatic theatre, one is starting to play around with uh, the actor talking to the audience, breaking the fiction. Again, in the Hamlet machine play, you may see the Hamlet actor saying, I'm not playing along anymore. And again, in Anna Pettersson's play, she lets Hedwig in the wild duck uh, break character towards the end, and the actress uh, can then refuse to play out the character's suicide. And this play with the meta levels of theatre um, goes back to a heavily, is heavily inspired by theatre director Bertolt Brecht. Uh, he tried uh, during the 30s to find out new ways to engage the audience, um, not just following the story, but questioning it. And through that, he developed highly minimalistic aesthetics um, where, you, uh, where you pay more attention to why things are happening and the social dynamics at hand and how they may be changed. If you haven't heard so much about Brecht, you might have seen the movie Dogville, where these aesthetics are put into deliberate use as well. And the aesthetics from Dogville have then been quite directly moved into LARP. Um, and uh, Brecht also experimented with breaking the fiction in different ways to comment upon it. Uh, and this is also his uh, so-called Verfremdung techniques is in many ways what we have developed further into meta techniques. Even though we may use them to comment on the fiction, we often also use them uh, to open up the fiction uh, to new um, areas that are not available to us while we are playing realistically, such as the inner life of other characters. This playing with meta levels may look very, very different in different uh, uh, experimentations, uh, since there are so many levels you may play at, and you can also use them contradictory in different uh, in the, all the different tools you may have on stage. This is also why both the post-traumatic theatre and the contemporary LARP scene may look so different uh, in its individual works, while still exploring some of the same aspects. And one may, uh, one may also play with the awareness of fiction uh, and the difference between uh, fiction and reality uh, while doing political theatre, something that is uh, most certainly put into use in the feminist theatre. Uh, here, for example, you can see a play uh, or two versions of the same play, uh, where they have deliberately chosen to have actors with different bodies than their characters, and thereby um, applying a constant knowledge of their gender and race as social constructs, and not just something that is to be accepted as true. This is also a take that we may see in LARP, such as Saint Croix, playing out the slave colony where the characters wore different uh, headwear uh, in different color, to communicate the skin, skin color of the character. And of course, a deliberate use of performativity is also seen in our feminist LARPs. Now, as, uh, as we have covered, the post-traumatic theatre uh, are exploring many of the fields that we are interested in today in the contemporary LARP scene. And they are also fusing them together in different ways, making very different works and still, they can be called a movement. And I would like to say, to say the same about us. But Nordic LARP is not post-traumatic theatre.
We are our own valid movement. And even though we have borrowed uh, techniques from theatre, we have developed them further to uh, go well with what we want to do with them, and we have our, have our own traditions that we should be uh, recognized for. But through knowing about other art forms that are similar to us, we may gain different things. For example, legitimacy, which we are fighting with at the time. If we know about other art forms that are similar to us, it's easier for us to position ourselves in the art world today. It's easier for us to communicate our strengths in words that others may understand, for example, funders. We may also, since the post dramatic theatre, for example, have explored the same areas of interest that we are interested in, learn a lot from what they have developed, especially since we have some of the same premises, such as using real bodies, um, but have done different journeys and discovered different things. Theatre research is also a somewhat older field of study than LARP theory, and as such has a lot to, uh, to show us. Also, it takes physicality into a greater consideration than, for example, game studies that have so far been dominant within the LARP scene. They, on the other hand, may, may learn a great deal from us. For example, how to create actual participatory experiences <laughs> <laughs> that are not just... <laughs> that are not just herding audiences around, but creating actual co-creative uh, works. We have also explored more immersive, more kinds of immersive design. Uh, if we are looking at the immersive theatre today, they are mainly using immersion through environment, but we have further developed immersion through narrative, character and community. Furthermore, we are way better at creating consenting participation. <laughs> we are better at giving out information beforehand and we are better at uh, using techniques for players to opt in and opt out of experiences during play. This also goes back to uh, that we have more developed methods for participatory meta-communication. Now, even though the post-traumatic theatre has a lot of meta-theatricality going on, their participatory works actually are sorely lacking them. And here we have a lot to contribute to them. Yes. So I know that there are a lot of you uh, who are uh, already working on amaz amazing collaborations between the two fields, and I hope that for you, those of you who don't, you have gained an interest in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilda. So uh, at this point, find a friend that does fear of performing arts. Last but not least, we have our joker. Nina Neskanen will talk about social aspects of our community. During Nina's 20 years in LARP, she has been uh, she has seen powerful unity, painful uh, externality, and the endless opportunities for co-creation. Thus, she speaks for communality, safe LARP environment, and inclusiveness. Please welcome Nina. <laughs> Fellow Nutbunk participants, this keynote speech is labelled under Joker, but it intertwines with the whole deck of cards, and it's far from a joke. I give you the ro royal straight flush of deck shuffling. Safety. This community is hugely diverse. We come from 26 or 27 different countries. In our everyday lives, some of us have to live with totally different scale of safety. Some of, ha of us have to deal with oppression, discrimination, or even fear for their lives. I take my hat off to you. With safe, I mean two things in this speech. Safe from and safe to. 
safe from all kinds of harassment and abuse, and safe to join, to be included, and to ask for help. Last year I created a material called Safer LARPing. It was made to combat harassment in the Finnish game scene, but to be honest, instead of writing it, I'd rather have started the new LARP project I've been planning. Likewise, I don't really want to be here talking about safety. I'd much rather tell about my cool, sexy and ambitious thoughts on LARP design and theory, because safety is not sexy, it's not cool, it's not fun, it's a responsibility, it's loads of work, it's something we have to do, it's spoiling the sport, it's something we sometimes fail, it's a grasp of fear, have I been unsafe? LARP is creating together. So are other great things, like saving the world, defeating evil, surviving and starting anew. I'm thinking of Star Wars, Buffy, Harry Potter, Earthsea, Lord of the Rings, the Mad Adam trilogy, what have you. We read the book, we play the game or watch the movie, and we think, wow, I want to be there. I want to be that hero. I want to be like them. These stories are magical. I believe this magic is togetherness. Ever since I was a child, I've believed quite seriously that we can do pretty much anything with togetherness. Friendship, trust, love and belief. As we speak, I'm struggling to keep irony and cynicism out of these words. Struggling to set aside my anger and bitterness for a while. Maybe I'm making a fool of myself here. Because these words are naive and pompous, right? Delusional and utopian. They have nothing to do with our everyday lives. And yet everything. Because we long for togetherness. We want to belong, to be important, and to experience great things. That's why we are here. We have an idea of spending Knutpunkt with somebody. Hearing interesting stuff, hanging out, talking, partying, planning, playing. As long as our community is not safe, there is a dark side an evil force, an elemental of selfishness. It prevents us from venturing, it makes our creations falter, and we keep missing something we don't even know of, voices of those who feel too unsafe to speak. Does this sound strange to you? Are you annoyed, like, what is she talking about? What is this safety fuss? Then let me congratulate you. I'm very happy for you. If you have managed your life and LARP career without harassment, abuse or fear of missing out, you are privileged. Some of us are more privileged than others. Privilege or status is built on us by our history and the society around us. We don't deserve it, necessarily, in any way, but we can be worth it. Because with privilege comes power, and with power comes responsibility. Whether we want it or not, we have it. And we have to use it for good. The darkness is out there, whether we personally see it or not, it's out there. Maybe in here too. Harassment does not happen, nor does it occur. Harassment is a choice of action. I have experienced harassment, as has probably majority of everyone in this room. Harassment makes me feel like a worthless piece of meat. It rips off 
my right to be a person. It violates my safe space. Harassment is never about sex or flirting or giving a compliment. It's an attempt to misuse power. Harassment is always wrong. But because it is a choice of action, we can choose. And we can choose not to. I have also felt left out. It <clears throat> feels horrible. It eats me from the inside. It takes the breath away, like being struck. It makes every step unsafe. And it accumulates. It poisons the surroundings. It paints me invisible. I'm terrified of it. I'm terrified of not being heard and included and asked to join. <clears throat> but inclusiv inclusivity and exclusivity are choices of action too. We can choose and we can choose not to. Unsafety means failing and losing the battle. Not only is it losing to those who are driven away, but for us all, we all lose. Hearts, clubs, diamonds and spades are hollow and lost without safety from harmful things and without safety to belong. Without safety, there is no true togetherness. If I'd have to condense safety from harassment and abuse in one word, it would be protect. Protect first of all oneself by knowing one's boundaries and saying no. Protect others by respecting their boundaries and remembering that only yes is a yes. Protect by using one's privilege to care. If I'd have to condense safety to belong in one word, it would be join. Join as in include and connect. Joining someone in and joining in oneself. Join and protect. This sounds heroic to me. We can listen, welcome and introduce as the Knutpunkt Code of Conduct laudably instructs. We can be kind, friendly and empathic. We can question, mentor and lead. We can yield fight and help. This is something I will try to do, even though it's not always easy. I'm not a child anymore, but I still believe we can do anything we want. I invite and challenge you all to join me. Let's form a league of extraordinary togetherness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina.